to this uh, last session of today. Um, I think uh, this is an appropriate time also to express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference. Um, it's really great to have this opportunity to be together with um, uh, so many different people to talk about the SAFO and issues related to that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that I had the opportunity um, to be present here. And I thank uh, Professor Talai and um, Suna, where is he? The other people um, um, who have taken the effort and the trouble to organize this conference. In the next session, we have a couple of different approaches to uh, issues related uh, to uh, the genocide, to the SAFO. And the first is uh, Professor Otto Jastro, and um, I think s most of you will know him because he's very well known, especially among those speaking Toroyo languages, and he has done tremendous work in studying these languages, putting them to paper, collecting, and uh, of course stimulating other people, like Professor Talai here, to engage themselves with these languages. So I think we all owe Professor Yastro a great gratitude for that as well. Today, um, and well, just to, to, um, to catch up a little for those of you who haven't uh, uh, keep kept in touch with Professor Yastro, he has been working, of course, as you all know, in, in Germany for a long time, in Erlangen and in Heidelberg, but uh, for the last couple of years, he's working as a professor of Arabic studies in the Department of Middle East and Asian Studies in Tallinn, uh, in, in, in Tallinn University in Estland. Um, he is just going strong, I think, and I'm very happy that he is still uh, coming to conferences and contributing to the field. Um, and so today he will speak about the contribution of linguistics and dialectology to SIFO studies. Please, uh, welcome. Um, when I was a student, which is sometime uh, in the past, uh, we had uh, a discipline which was called <laughs> Orientalistic. This is discipline doesn't uh, exist any longer because uh, a person from Egypt came to America and made a career by telling the Americans that Orientalistic was very bad. And so the term we suddenly saw ourselves as criminals, and so the term was abolished. But uh, it was, in other words, oriental philology, and at my time it was at the center of all kinds of Middle Eastern studies. And Middle Eastern studies itself was a small field. Now this has changed considerably Middle Eastern studies <coughs> nowadays is a large field and it has been enriched by such modern disciplines as uh, modern Middle Eastern history, Islamic history, uh, sociology of the Middle East, politology of the Middle East, and so on and so on. And the actual field of Arabic philology or Middle Eastern philology which is at the core of any serious study of the Middle East, has been shrinking all the time, while the other disciplines have been growing and expanding. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> Middle Eastern philology is now a small uh, discipline, and inside this discipline, linguistics, and dialectology is even smaller. It's nowadays a very small field uh, which is practiced by very few people. So it is a small wonder that uh, the books which we, the, the uh, linguists and dialectologists are <coughs> writing are mainly uh, read by ourselves and our colleagues. And even people working in Middle Eastern studies, when they see books with a title like the Arabic dialect of dot, 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 a place that they have, they have never heard about, the Neo-Aramaic dialect of dot, 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 so they will immediately put the book aside or they will, when they are reading it in a catalog, they will immediately uh, pass to the next page. This 
may be a mistake in some, in some cases. Because when we write about a certain dialect, we describe its grammar, but we also have to give examples of the living language and therefore many uh, books on dialects contain a large uh, portion of texts, texts in the original language, in transcription, but also in German or English translation. And these texts speak about the life of the people, uh, but very often they also speak about the recent past or the not so recent past and about the stories uh, of the grandfathers. And it's not unusual to find some mention of the Seifo and some mention of places and people which were also concerned by the Seifo, but which uh, are not mentioned in the official literature. Uh, so, um, <coughs> uh, when I was asked yesterday, somebody asked me, uh, your lecture seems to be the only linguistic lecture in the whole conference. What kind of linguistics is it, will it be? Sociolinguistics or whatever, and I reflected for a moment and I said, it will be personal linguistics. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I'm going to tell you a few things about my own uh, career and then you will understand what uh, the importance of dialectology for other Middle Eastern studies is. <clears throat> As a young student, I was fascinated by the languages of the Middle East, in particular Semitic languages. I wanted uh, to learn them, but I also wanted to speak them. And since we have this phenomenon of diglossia, not only in Arabic, but in a certain sense also in Aramaic, I was mostly interested in the spoken modern varieties. And so, uh, I went very, uh, very early, I went to the Middle East to learn to speak some languages and a little later also to, in, to uh, research some lesser known languages and hopefully to discover some new languages. And the place where I went first of all was Turkey because Turkey had this uh, reputation of being home to a number of languages, including a number of Arabic and Neo-Aramaic languages. Um, I spent half a year, as a young man, I spent half a year in Mardin, and I learned the beautiful language of that beautiful city. I spent uh, three months in Siirt, also studying the dialect. And while placed in Mardin and Siirt, I made a lot of excursions in the surrounding uh, country and I discovered a number of uh, beautiful and interesting, mostly Arabic dialects. And um, <coughs> After a while, I realized that all the dialects which I came across, all the dialects which were still spoken in that area, were spoken by Muslims, or almost all of them. So after a while, I became suspicious, uh, and I started to ask the Arabic speakers in Mardin and Siirt, and said, why are there no Christians speaking Arabic? Where are those uh, Christian dialects we are reading about in the older literature? And then the answer would be, well, they are no longer here. And 
What happened? How long are they no longer here? Oh, it's a long time ago. Uh, this made me somewhat unhappy. And uh, I could not accept uh, this explanation. And I started to research. I started to ask. I started to travel around. I visited churches, remaining churches, remaining communities. I talked to priests because I wanted to find out <coughs> what had happened to those communities. Why were they not there any longer? You can see from this narrative that I was a very innocent young man. I had only very nebulous ideas about the SAFO, if at all. And then gradually I discovered that many of the populations which I actually had hoped to meet and whose languages I had actually hoped to study had been did exterminated long before I was born. And that was a big shock for me, but somehow I didn't want to accept this fact and I tried very hard to find some remnants, some vestiges, some indications of those languages. And in fact, I was able to discover a few languages and to document and to describe them 60 years after they had actually died out. How was that possible? Well, there are always a few people who su survive uh, a genocidal action. There may be some young boys who are playing in the vineyard when the killer bands arrive. And when they return to the village, everybody has been killed and the killers have left. And then one, two, three children are, are left alive. And I met some such people who had spoken their own language for the last time, 50, 60 years ago, but who were able, with great effort, to remember some elements, some words, some forms. And so I gradually was able to collect information and evidence and to reconstruct uh, a number of languages. I will just give you one or two examples. The most uh, interesting and probably the most uh, well-known example is the language of Malahso. I was in Diyarbakir a long time ago. I'm always almost embarrassed to tell you the date. It was 1967. Uh, and I was looking for the <coughs> Arabic-speaking Christians who had been living in Diyarbakir and in the surrounding villages. And I was able to find a few people who could just remember <coughs> a few words. Uh, but later on, in Beirut, I found people who, uh, in fact, a, an old woman and her daughter, who could speak the language uh, better. And so I was able to document the Arabic dialect of especially the village of Kaabiye, 60 years after it had died out. But while I was <laughs> working in uh, Diyarbakir, the local priest one day brought an old man and he said, this man is speaking a language which you haven't heard yet. And that was the language of Melahso. And there was also an old woman who was later introduced to me. And these two people were not really able to say a single sentence. They were stuttering. They were remembering some words. 
you could really see and feel that they haven't been speak, speaking the language for decades. But, and at that point, uh, I was not able to realize how important this language was. Uh, because lexically, it is rather similar to Toroyo. But um, I wanted to continue the study, and then I was told that in Qamishli, in Syria, there was another old man who knew the language much better, Ibrahim Hanna. Professor Tala knows him as well. And so one year later, I went to Qamishli. I found this old man, and he was speaking bulbul, as we say in Turkish. <laughs> he was speaking very well, and I was so happy, and I said, you know, I want to study your language. And he said, of course, you're welcome. Uh, we can start tomorrow morning. And next morning he came and he said, I'm very sorry, uh, but you know, we are in Syria. I have to be careful. I cannot work with you. Uh, so I was very disappointed. Later on, it turned out that it was his son who was actually sabotaging the whole thing. And then he told me, but you know, in summer, I will be in Lebanon because one of my daughters is living in Lebanon. And there I feel completely free and there we can meet and I can, I can uh, answer you all the questions. So when he arrived in Lebanon, I went to meet him and we had one very good meeting and I was looking forward to a few more meetings and I could already see the, the ready book before my eyes and then next day, a woman who was part of the, uh, of the family died and they went immediately back to Kramishli. Uh, so I was left with some text, but really not enough. And uh, it was not enough to understand the grammar correctly. And then uh, a, few, a few years later, together with my uh, erstwhile uh, student and uh, friend uh, Werner Arnold, we went to Kamishli to meet this old man again. By that time he was completely deaf, he couldn't understand what you were saying, but he had a daughter, Rahel, who could not speak, but she remembered a lot of words and forms because basically the old man had always been telling stories. And he had been telling the stories almost always in the, same, in the same way. So she kind of knew them by heart. And with the help of this daughter, I was finally, after so many years, I was finally able to understand the grammar. And then I was able to write a small book, uh, not completely satisfactory, but with a grammatical description <laughs> and uh, texts and the glossary. I see I cannot speak about some other discoveries, but what I would like to say is this book uh, was turned out to be quite important for Neo-Aramaic studies and it, it is quoted a lot. And it was mere coincidence that I met this speaker. And if I hadn't met him, he would have died and the language would have died out without anybody knowing that it had ever <laughs> existed. And this is one of the important things of fieldwork, that you can find things which are on the brink of extinction and you can draw them back from the brink of extinction and you can at least preserve them for, <coughs> for scholarly work. And you can also preserve the name of the people and the name of the language. You know that we are speaking, in this conference we are speaking a lot about remembrance. The most impressive place of remembrance is um, the place Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, which is dedicated to the victims of the Holocaust, 
And the motto of this place is Le Col Ish Yesh Shem. And if we translate this into Royo, it becomes very easy to understand. It means Kul no Sho Kitle Ishbo. Sorry. Kul no Sho Kitle Ishbo. Every man has a name. And by drawing this name out of the darkness of history, we can restore some of the dignity to the victims. <laughs> I'm sorry. And this is one of the uh, beautiful things of dialectology, uh, dialectologic, dialectological work. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Yastrow, for this uh, impressive um, uh, recollection of your, of, of your history, but the history of so many people here. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Um, the next um, paper will be presented by Dr. Hanna Müller-Sommerfeld. I'm trying to locate her, yes. Um, um, Dr. Müller-Sommerfeld, now I have to... Uh, check very quickly, is an independent scholar and ha she has been doing a lot of work um, especially on the history of the Assyrians in North Iraq lately, um, working on uh, especially on the archives of the League of Nations which provide a lot of information that uh, add to what we have already on sources from the communities themselves. Um, and she will speak today on the title Assyrian Christians in Iraq, the League of Nations and International Christian Advocacy, 1920-1940. Please, Hannah, uh, take the floor. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for the generous invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and give a presentation about Assyrian Christians in Iraq, the League of Nations, and international Christian advocacy from 1920 to 1940s. As you can deduce from the title, it has nothing to do directly with SAFO, but with consequences of the resettlement of the Assyrian Christians uh, from Iraq to Syria. Over the last years, researches on advocacy as part of the political process abounded, and manifold definitions were given. Advocacy has several forms and can include many activities that a person or organization undertakes, including media campaigns, public speaking, commissioning, and publishing, uh, or direct lobbying. My interest here concerns only individual or collective uh, action to influence governmental uh, decisions on behalf of others. The advocacy of the Syrian Christians by themselves lies outside the scope of my presentation. During the two decades considered here, Assyrian Christians had powerful spokespersons outside in, uh, of Iraq, mainly in London. From the 1920s, in the front line, were the Archbishops of Canterbury, who intervened for them countless times with the British government and assumed the patronage of several British relief committees and appeals for Assyrian Christians. Since this continuous support of the Lambeth Palace is more or less known, my topic focuses exclusively on a second important uh, um, advocacy hub, uh, which is barely uh, known. This was the League of Nations Union, a most influential organization and popular mass movement in interwar Britain, as well as the related World Alliance uh, for promoting international friendships through the churches, an international ecumenical association of Protestant churches and free churches, though she was mostly in the shadow of the League of Nations Union. In the first part of my presentation, I introduce individuals of this international uh, advocacy uh, network for Assyrian Christians. The second part will deal with three episodes of its booting. The first, apparently moderate, concerned the international dispute over the borderline between Turkey and Iraq in Geneva. The second and more masterful uh, campaign started after the British announcement uh, of the termination of the mandate uh, regime in Iraq and succeeded in the uh, declaration of guarantees of the Kingdom of Iraq in May 1932. The third was related uh, to the resettlement project of the Syrian Christians from Iraq to Syria by the League of Nations. My presentation is based mainly on unpublished sources of the, uh, from the archives of the League of Nations, which to date are missing from the historical uh, studies on Assyrian Christians, not to speak uh, about Iraq all in all. My main concern 
is here to recover the original voice of the League of Nations and thus to fill a gap, a long-standing gap in the historiography of the Assyrian Christians. I would like to start now with the first part of my presentation and introduce briefly the main actors of the advocacy network who intervened for the Assyrian Christians. The League of Nations Union and the World uh, Alliance uh, had roots in the peace movement and were closely linked through personal and ideological overlaps, such as the stance support of the League of Nations as a guarantee for collective security and peace and the system of international minority protection. Both organizations considered minority questions as questions of international concern since they saw them as a threat to the permanent world peace and international order. Hence, Assyrian Christians had beside the Lambeth Palace uh, in London unexpected influential permanent suppliers with direct access to the League of Nations, the British government and parliament. Involved were mainly three personalities. First, Robert Cecil, lawyer and parliamentarian, and son of the great 19th century conservative prime minister, the third Marquis of Salisbury. Cecil was a fervent supporter of the League of Nations and several times a British delegate to Geneva. He presided over the League of Nations from 1923 to 1945. The second was Gilbert Murray, an outstanding classical scholar from Oxford, chairman of the executive committee of the League of Nations unit, a union and substitute member of the British delegation to the Assembly of the League of Nations from 1921 to 1924. And third, Willow B. Dickinson, also a lawyer, a honorary secretary and later president of the World Alliance, as well a member of the League of Nations Union and a chairman of the Minorities Committee of the International Federation of the League of Nations Societies. In acute situations, the international advocacy network of Assyrian Christians uh, was booted and extended into a second row. This meant the founding of a re relief committees which undertook the task of media campaigns, public speaking, publishing of articles and appeals in newspapers, and collecting funds. Most members of the second row of sustainers had direct links to Assyrian Christians. These were, for instance, the mentioned Canon William Wickham, Francis Hiesel, both members of the Archbishop's uh, uh, mission uh, to the Assyrian Christians, William M. Hart, secretary of the Episcopal Church from the United States, which was involved with the priest and layman in the Archbishop's mission, Captain George Gracie, the British Army officer who, according to the narrative of the Assyrian Christians, enticed them into the war on behalf of the allies with the promise of support after the end of war, and Colonel Stafford, administrative uh, inspector in Mosul. It is striking that Percy Cox, the first British High Commissioner in Iraq, never appeared in British networks, whilst Arnold Wilson, the first British Civil Commissioner in Iraq, was engaged through the League of Nations Union, as we will hear soon. Lastly, the ecumenicist Adolf Keller from Switzerland must be mentioned, who was very committed uh, to refugee work since the 1920s. He belonged also to the mentioned minority committee of the International Federation of League of Nations societies and intervened for Assyrian Christians a few times with the League of Nations. Keller was certainly of importance for the Catholicos Marchimun uh, as I during his days in Geneva. Most of these uh, supporters were motivated by unquestioned Christian solidarity. For them, the tiny minority of Assyrian Christians alleged tales of a great Assyrian past and all these Christian people, as Emmett titled his book from 1926, needed general support since they were threatened with annihilation by the Arab Islamic majority. At the risk of making myself unpopular, I will now say that this argument must be questioned, not only because it fostered a one-sided official modern narrative of Assyrian Christians as an eternal persecuted minority, and as well as their problematic Assyrian and ethnic ancestry. It must be criticized particularly because it failed to recognize the universality of the problem of majorities and minorities, which cannot be reduced to a unilateral religious polemical dimension. Now I'd like to turn to the second part of my presentation and present three episodes of advocacy of the League of Nations Union. The first concerns the international dispute over the borderline between Turkey and Iraq. Since the direct uh, negotiations over the Mosul province failed in Lausanne in 1923, the conflict was referred to the League of Nations for arbitration. From the archives of the League of Nations, apparently only a moderate intervention of the World Alliance uh, can be traced in this connection. Dickinson wrote a letter in mid-September 1924 to Geneva asking the Council, uh, in interest of Christianity, to bear in mind the serious results which would occur 
if the territory of the Assyrian Christians would be placed outside uh, of British control. In light of Dickinson's zealous engagement with minority issues and all the more of Cecil and Murray, it, this was not the whole story. The missing part, I guess, is to be found in British archives. The second episode of advocacy of, uh, for Assyrian Christians was greater and more successful. It was triggered uh, by the uh, announcement of the British government in November 1929 to terminate the mandate in Iraq. This set the leading figures of the League of Nations Union and World Alliance in a state of alert. They were even more alarmed when they learned that the political agreement between Britain and Iraq from June 1930 will not contain any special provisions for the treatment of racial and religious minorities uh, upon the termination of the mandate. Under these circumstances, I consider the well-known expedition of Anthony Ressam to northern Iraq from January to June 1930 as a planned action of the League of Nations Union, which naturally was backed by uh, Cosmo Kantwar, the Archbishop of Canterbury. The League of Nations lacked general, in general direct and reliable, reliable information about the minorities in question and was often criticized for. Thus, the League of Nations Union and the World Alliance, as firm pressure groups for her system of minority protection, undertook, when possible, the task to procure information from the ground. The World Alliance was especially enabled since she had, through Dickinson, direct ecclesiastical connections uh, with several minorities in Europe. But she has no tie uh, to Iraq, and therefore Rassam's expedition must have been planned. As he put it himself, his task was to collect first-hand information from and about uh, the Iraqi minorities, free from oriental exaggerations. The next advocacy step was to exert pressure upon the decision-maker in Geneva by petitions. After the return from Iraq, Rassam sent in September 1930 a voluminous petition with over 80 pages uh, to the Mandates Commission. She comprised his own memorandum, several other petitions and documents concerning his qualification as official spokesperson for the minorities in Iraq. Rassam's own memorandum is the most professional and extensive uh, petition I've ever seen in the archives of Geneva. I assume that this high quality is owed to the little boost of the mentioned Arnold Wilson, member of the Iraq uh, Committee of the League of Nations Union. In parallel, the third step of advocacy was initi initiated, internal mobilization and influencing public opinion. Into play came Rassam's Iraqi Minorities Rescue Committee, to which Emhard Vigram Hiesel, Gracie and other personalities belonged. I traced for the year 1931 three appeals of this committee. They were launched on the 31st of January, on 17th of August and 1st of October. Additionally, individual members published calls for financial support in different British newspapers, such as the Times, the Manchester Guardian, and uh, or Church Times. Meanwhile, Murray entered directly the, on political stage. He transmitted in mid-1931 to the Mandates Commission a draft declaration on minority rights to be made by the Iraqi government before the termination of the Mandate regime. Obviously, he was not satisfied with the official declaration of the British government uh, that the minority rights in Iraq were enough secured by the existing legislation. Yet, Murray had gone too far. His proposals steered the harsh critique from the British Foreign Minister Arthur Henderson, and therefore he revoked his intervention. But the Man Mandates Commission followed his initial proposal. This is understandable not only when one knows that Frederick Lugard, a member of the Mandates Commission, belonged as well to the Iraq <laughs> Committee of the League of Nations Union. All the more, the Mandates Commission itself had profound reservations about the minority protection of the Iraqi government. Moreover, since Rassam's survey did serious local unrest in northern Iraq, she was bombarded by petitions against the termination of the Mandate regime, what can be seen also a part of the advocacy strategy of the League of Nations Union. Nonetheless, the Mandates Commission recommended in June 1931 the termination of the mandate regime in Iraq under the condition that the Iraqi government would give before a declaration of guarantees for minority rights. Afterwards, a special uh, commission worked out a text for which the terms of the Albanian Declaration served as model. Nuri Said signed the declaration on the 30th of May 1932. As regards the content, Murray's proposals can be traced in Article 7 concerning the pious foundations and in Article 9, which stipulates that in those regions in which the population is predominantly Kurdish, the Kurdish language uh, should be the official language beside Arabic. 
even though this uh, exemplary three-step advocacy campaign of the League of Nations Union had some unexpected turns, she can be deemed successful. A special legislation for minority rights in Iraq was secured upon the termination of the mandate. But the assumed protection proved too soon to be void, since the Iraqi army committed a massacre uh, against Assyrian Christians in July and August 1933. This brings me now to the third and last episode of advocacy of the League of Nations Union related to the resettlement of the Assyrian Christians by the League of Nations. The tragic news from Iraq caused an uh, international outcry and intensive campaigns in newspapers blaming the British government and the League of Nations to have ended the mandate regime in Iraq too soon. The so-called Assyrian Christian became overnight a public international affair with heavy pressure from the public opinion. Under these constraints, Geneva had to react morally and declared thus in October 1933 officially the case of the Assyrian Christians as exceptional like involving likewise exceptional measures. Because after the massacre, all the hopes of for a peaceful settlement in As uh, of Assyrian Christians in Iraq had to be given up, the League of Nations made several international inquiries with governments for a suitable territory for them. Two projects seemed promising, but they had to be given up. In Brazil, because of nationalistic politics and rigid immigration laws, in British Guyana, because of the unsuitability of climate. Thus, after two uh, years, Geneva was back to square one. But then, the French government offered surprisingly the very costly Gaf settlement scheme in northwestern Syria, which was more her own development uh, plan for the region. The cost of this undertaking, with over one million British pounds, of which the British and Iraqi government promised to, subscri to subscribe 250,000 pounds each, the French mandate regime uh, 380,000 pounds, and the League of Nations, as such, 86,000 pounds. Moral constraints, obviously, can turn out very expensive. The uncovered amount of over 100,000 pounds was taken over by the League of Nations Union, which launched afterwards uh, an appeal for funds. At this time, she was riding on the crest of her greatest uh, success in Great Britain. In her so-called uh, peace ballot from June 1935, over 11 and a half million votes had been cast. The respondents backed overwhelmingly the po her policy in the issues of British membership in the League of Nations and disarmament. In Geneva, the decisive influence of the League of Nations Union of, uh, of the, uh, in the Assyrian Christian affair can be seen as well in the official labeling of their resettlement as a work of appeasement and uh, humanity. It is therefore hardly surprising that the declaration of the political committee of the League of Nations Assembly from September 1935 over the mentioned financial plan could also have been published as an own statement of the League of Nations Union. The text is full of her political idealism and sounded as follows. Assyrian Christians were not a refugee problem, but an eminently political problem. Its immediate and radical solution would greatly contribute to the maintenance of peace and tranquility in the Near East. Its abandonment would have consequences which would affect not only the Assyrians and Iraq, but also other states with reactions which would be bounded to damage the highest interests of the League of Nations. Even though within the League of Nations uh, was considerable internal resistance against the overpriced very last chance to settle the Assyrian Christians uh, in, in this final results, on the textual and financial level must have afforded wide advocacy behind the scenes. This follows especially when thinking about the Nansen office uh, for refugees, which settled, for example, a minions in Syria to a much lower cost and never received funds from the League of Nations. Somehow, the resettlement of the Syrian Christians remained full of surprises until the end. Besides technical local problems, much greater complications uh, occurred on the political level. The new French government announced in June 1936 to the termination of the mandate regime in the Levant states. Thus, the planned Gaf settlement quickly faded to nothing, and the initial temporary Havur settlement became definitive. It remained under the surveillance of the League of Nations until 1941, when the last situation report reached Geneva. All in all, from a technical point of view, uh, for the League of Nations, this project was a success. Whether this applies to, as well to Assyrian Christians, Professor Talai uh, can give us surely more detailed uh, information. Summarizing my presentation, the Christian advocacy done uh, at the League of Nations was of great importance. The League of Nations Union influenced significantly the course of events by triggering 
the elaboration of a declaration of guarantees of the Iraqi government in May uh, 1932, and by imprinting her terminology and romanticized uh, interpretation of minorities on the resettlement project of Assyrian Christians by the League of Nations. Cecil Murray and Dickinson were exemplary uh, activists beyond borders, as advocacy in international politics was termed by Margaret Keck and Katyn Sinking in their study from 1998. But since the archival materials from Geneva offer an, uh, an incomplete uh, insight into their advocacy work, further research in British uh, archives is needed and uh, to create a complete picture. All in all, the League of Nations itself can be seen as an unintentional advocacy uh, advocate for Assyrian Christians. Her system of minority protection, which was developed as a legal protection shield against possible atrocities uh, of nationalist majorities, was deeply entangled with the history of the Assyrian Christians. Their leadership used and misused it to secure the traditional order of the Apostolic Church of the East into the new political area. Minority rights became especially for the young Catholic Cosma Shimun Eshai a weapon in his fight against the recognition of the sovereignty of Iraq, showing openly the Achilles heel of the international minority protection. To conclude, the League of Nations was an indispensable and independent player in the history of the Assyrian Christians. Moreover, this applies to the Near East in general, since the League of Nations uh, is to date overshadowed in our researches by the presence of the mandatory powers, Great Britain and France. I thank you for your attention. Our next um, speaker, uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Hannah, and I look forward to the discussion. Our next speaker is Abdul Masih Bar Abraham, who has a Master of Science in Engineering from the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg, but who has also done a lot of work in the history and languages of the Middle East, and that's what he will speak about today. Um, and it's, uh, I think uh, we should mention um, the uh, Jochen Bar Jochen Foundation, which I have to say I had to look up. I wasn't familiar with it, but it looks very interesting, and I hope to hear more about it sometime during the breaks. Um, um, Abdul Masih Bar Abram will speak about the issue of Germany and its involvement in Cypher 1915. So how much did Germany know is the question. And uh, I welcome you. Please take the floor. Thank you, Helen, uh, for the nice introduction. I would like also to thank for the organizers, um, for Professor Shabo, uh, Inanna Foundation for organizing this really with, based on a unity approach, this conference. As um, Professor David Gaun today morning said, we need as a community really to uh, form a, a unity in, in ethnic and, and also in, in, a, in a policy for lobbying. And uh, I think this conference is, is uh, very, very helpful uh, for this. Uh, thank you very much for that. So being the last speaker, I guess I have a lot of time now to talk. <laughs> Uh, Be very strict. <laughs> you have some time for discussion. Thank you. I hope I have your attention. Yeah, Germany. Germany uh, was um, a very close uh, ally of the Ottoman Empire during uh, uh, the First World War. One uh, military cooperation expanded and reached a climax during the war. And hundreds of German officers were actually employed as advisors and even commanders in the significant positions in the Turkish army. In addition, Germany relied on an extensive network of diplomats and relief organizations spread across Anatolia throughout the wartime. So German diplomats reported regularly and in very detailed manner to Berlin about the atro atrocities committed against the Armenians and other Christians in Anatolia. The German Foreign Office documents revealed that Germany was very well informed with respect to what Germany labeled as the internal administrative affairs of the Ottoman Empire. However, extreme press censorship prevented any critical reporting to the public, and the public was kept in dark. The War Office, the war office uh, actually sought to prevent reporting on the massacres in German newspapers and magazines. So on October 7th, 1915, the following press policy was announced in Berlin, and as you can see on the slide, our friendly relations with Turkey may not only not put at risk by the domestic Turkish administrative matter, but in the current difficult moment, not even questioned. Therefore, it is for the time being duty to keep silent. Later, when direct attacks from abroad should be made for German complicity, 
The issue needs to be treated with the utmost caution and restraint and later pretend that the Turks were seriously irritated by the Armenians. So all translation that you will see, or most of them are mine. I hope uh, I have done the job correctly. So this was followed by further guidance on December 3rd, 1915. About, and this is a very famous uh, statement now seen in many books, about the Armenian issue is best to keep quiet. The behavior of the Turkish authorities on this issue is not particularly price worthy. In fact, the then Chancellor Theobald von Bettmann Holweg dismissed even critical information diplomats and military personnel were providing, urging actions through diplomatic channels against the atrocities Armenians faced. As the German ambassador uh, Wolf Metternich uh, advised the Chancellor in 1915 to intervene vigorously at the Sublime Porte, the central government of the Ottoman Empire, in favor of the Armenians, the Chancellor commented on the diplomatic report on December 7th, and we can see this in a handwritten note, our only goal is to, cop to keep Turkey on our side until the end of the war, regardless of whether the Armenians perish or not. The extent of complicity and resulting responsibility of Germany <coughs> to the murder and expulsion of the Armenians has been well researched by a number of Armenian and non-Armenian scholars in the past. In a most recent publication by Jürgen Gottschlich, he particularly investigated the role of the German, German military advisors to the young government and Turkish army and speaks of complicity in genocide. Beihilfe zum Völkermord. Today, the German, Germany is well aware of its responsibility regarding the genocide and even though until recently it avoided to call it Volkermord. As Professor Schabo in yesterday's in introduction, invitation, uh, early speech uh, mentioned, uh, on June 15, on the occasion of the 19th anniversary, the German Bundestag passed a notion supported by all parties commemorating and honoring the Armenian victims and the motion casually mentions Assyrians, Arameans as victims too. Most recently, most recently, on April 24th, the Bundestag commemorated the 100th anniversary of the massacres. So German lawmakers, as we know, for the first time used the term genocide. Syria Christians, Assyrians, Chaldeans, Arameans were again explicitly honored as victims. The German president, Joachim Gauck, went even further and spoke not only of responsibility of Germany, but also of shared guilt, and mentioned again Assyrians and Arameans as fellow sufferer. So German sources for the study of SAFO. This is the speech, I am not going to read it because of time. German sources um, uh, or the cognizance, the Mitwisserschaft of Germany in the annihilation of the Assyrians, Assyriacs, uh, Christians, which remained for decades in the shadow of the Armenian genocide has been treated in a pioneering work um, a forgotten Holocaust by Gabriele Yonan back in 1989 using, among others, selected documents from German Foreign Office and also referencing Lepsius' report of 1916. Yonan elaborates in her book about the responsibility of Germany. David Gaunt, Massacre's Resistance Protectors, has made a great use of the German Foreign Office documents as well. So the aim of my presentation is to present some results of a systematic investigation as an engineer, you have a tendency to systematic uh, of Johannes Lepsius' first publication from 1916 under the title Bericht zur Armenischen, zur Lage des Armenischen Volkes in der Türkei, which is a report on the situation of the Armenian people in Turkey, published in 1916. In the following, just referred to as Bericht, to reveal knowledge Germany had with regards to the destruction of the Assyrian Syriac as a multi-denominational Christian population of the Ottoman state, along with the Armenians. In addition, the German Foreign Office document, published by Lepidius, <coughs> will be utilized. And this collection is uh, about four, 444 documents, uh, which can be regarded as the German White Book to the uh, Armenian Genocide. <coughs> this collection, as the title suggests, predominantly treats the Armenian question, and fate of the Armenians as a major Christian population, but has also many relevant references to the Assyrians, Syria Christians, and their fate during 1915. The investigation takes also into account the various designations 
and religious denominations of Eastern and Western Assyrians, also known as Syriacs, and the various churches, Nestorian, Chaldean, Syriac Orthodox, Syrian Catholic, Syrian Protestants, while some document explicitly mentions Syrians as a common denominational designation, many others generally speak of other Christians while reporting on Armenians. So Lepsius Bericht. Beginning of June 1915, Lepsius received a telegraphic message uh, which was sent by the German ambassador in Constantinople informing him about the planned deportations in Anatolia. Lepsius traveled in July 15 to Constantinople to verify the situation and to use his influence and contacts to change the course of events. And however, he, uh, he failed over there and he was able to obtain a substantial amount of documents and reports on the tragedy that was still unfolding. Right after his return to Berlin in October 1915, he intensively lobbied, lectured about his findings, and was able to pursue the influential members of the Evangelical Church and the Catholic Church to appeal to the German Chancellor. On October 15, the following petition was sent um, to, to the uh, uh, petition of 50 reputable representatives of the Evangelical Church to the Chancellor gave expression to the concerns and wishes of the German Christians. The lengthy appeal, this is just a short extract of it in the top, uh, says, it oppresses our conscience that while Germans press praises the magnanimity, grossmut, grossherzigkeit, and tolerance of our Muslim ally, Mohammedans spill blood of innocent Christian in streams and tens of thousands of Christians are forcibly converted to Islam, speaking in general terms of, of Christians. Both appeals uh, uh, were sent, so the Catholic and the Evangelic were sent as an attachment uh, to the embassy in, uh, in Istanbul on November 10th with a request to be directed to the Porte uh, with a statement, the measures of the Porte, that the measures of the Porte are not extended to include other Christian parts of the population in Turkey. So the Chancellor's response to the appeal to the evangelical side was that it's one of the imperial government's noble duties to use its influence to the extent that Christian nations, so not just the Armenians, Christian nations are not persecuted because of their faith. So Lepsius document, documented his findings and wrote a highly uh, confidential report, <coughs> which was sent, which we have seen on the next slide, and that was sent to the uh, evangelical church members and German Reichstag members uh, as he counted on their help. Uh, overall, this well-intended action failed too because most of the 20,000 distributed copies were confiscated by the censors. So, Assyrian Syriacs in Lepsius publications. In the following, uh, because of time limit, really just to focus on flu on Fruyu uh, Vilayets. Uh, on few vilayets where Lepsius lists a Syrian Syriac presence, referring to them as Syrians or applying even denominational terms. However, it's important to emphasize in advance that there are no indications in Lepsius Bericht or the Foreign Office documents that nor Armenians have been spared by the described actions related to Armenians or that Assyrian or Syriacs uh, as Christians were dealt with differently from Armenians. It's very important, I think, to underline. Already on the first page of uh, Lepsius Bericht, um, there is a mentioning uh, of the Nestorians along with the Armenians, saying the oldest people of Christendom are in danger to be destroyed. Six sevenths of the Armenian people have been deprived of their possession, driven <coughs> from the farms and as long as they have not converted to Islam, are either killed or sent into the desert. Only one seventh of the people have been spared from the deportation. Like the Armenians, the Syrians, Nestorians, uh, and partly also the Greek Christians have been afflicted. In the early 1915, prior to the official deportation decree from May 27th, uh, there were repressive measures visible by the government in areas allegedly close to the front. So Vice Consul Hermann Hoffmann, Volker Samp reports from Iskenderun that during the last few days, house by house searches took place at all homes of the Christian subjects of the Ottoman Empire residing here, Armenians, Syrians, Greeks, 
on order from higher up, parentheses most likely from Constantinople, in some houses papers were confiscated, apparently only because they were in a foreign language. But very soon the deportation started and expanded into those regions which are not situated near the front. So we will stick for a while on this uh, slide, as uh, <coughs> these are the seven villa at Lepsius streets in the detail and provides population statistics actually. Again, for time reason, we cannot go through the old vilayets. I will depict a couple of them. So Harput, um, around the same time, end of June and beginning of July 1915, while the general deportation was taking place in the vilayets of Trabzon, Erzurum, Sivas, the deportation of the Armenian population of the province of Harput was conducted. With regards to the course of the deportation from Harput, Lepsius, Lepsius quotes the American consul Leslie Davis and declares that the contents of his report were in line with the information from German sources. The first transport took place in the night of June 23rd. Among them were several professors of the American Euphrat College and other Armenians and the prelate of the Armenian Gregorian Church. From other sources, we know, of course, that Asher Yusuf was, was among the arrested professors who was teaching at the Euphrat College too. The preacher of the German Christian charity organization for the Orient and head of the orphanage, Johannes Eman, reports that after all the suffering in the past, deportation has now been ordered indiscriminately for the entire Christian population of the town and in the country. So Lepsius further reports that three quarters of Harput's all Christian population, all Christian population, have been sent away. The rest have no guarantees that they can stay since the Wali insists that all be sent away. The German consul in Mosul, Walter Ressler, confirmed the fate of the man from Kharput. The men were slaughtered to death and lay to the right and left of the road, along which the woman then had to pass. The Arbaker. Lepsius outlined the approach uh, of the authorities in the Arbaker against the Christian population and explicitly again points to the fact that his description are in accordance with the reports of German officials he talked to during his stay in Turkey. I quote, between May 10 and 30th, more than 1,200 of the most distinguished among <coughs> the Armenians and Syrians of the Vilayet were arrested. 674 of them were loaded on rafts under the pretext that they will be brought to Mosul. The transport was led by the adjutant of the Wali, valley, along with about 50 gendarmes. Soon after the departure, the gendarmes took all the money of the people and their clothes off, and then they threw them all into the river. Quote end. On June 11, the German vice consul from Mosul confirms what happened to those who were banned from the Arbaker, were slaughtered on their journey. Parts of the corpses had been floating on the Euphrates for days, the valley of Mosul expressed his regret and held the valley of the Arbaka responsible for this. Holstein reports that the former Mutasharif, or Mutasharif which is the sub-governor uh, of Mardin, have said to him, the valley of the Arbaka, Rashid Bey, rages like a mad bloodhound uh, among the Christian in the Vilayet, bloodhound. Holstein again from Mosul on July 16th, Recently, by the order of the Wali of the Arbakar, the Kaimakam of Midyad, a Muslim, was killed because he had refused to let Christian massacre of his district. A couple of weeks later, and it goes on this way, a couple of weeks later, Wallstein confirms that women and children were left to cope on their own and writes about the consequences. Of those banned from the Vilayat of the Arbakar, only women and children have arrived in Mosul. Uh, and uh, of the latter, about one third of the original number. Of the women, the young ones were divided among the Muslim courts. Lepsius mentioned that on September 2nd, the Christian uh, population of Jazire in the Vilayat of the Arbakar has been massacred. 4,750 Armenians, 250 Catholic Chaldeans, and 100 Syrian Jacobites. This is confirmed also by other sources by a cable report German Ambassador Hohenlohe sent on September 9th to the Foreign Ministry in Berlin. Mardin. 
Mardin was a Sanjak, a second level administrative level division within the Vilayet of uh, Diyarbakir. Lepsius reports that the Mutashara of the local governor of Mardin was removed because he did not want to deal with the Christians according to the will of the Wali Rashid Bey. Lepsius mentioned that after the removal, first 500, then 300 Armenians and Syrian notables were taken on the way to Diyarbakir. The first 500 arrived, apparently, in Diyarbakir, though nobody heard anything from the other 300. Walter Holstein sent a telegram from Mosul to the embassy in Constantinople complaining that the conditions in the district Mardin and Ahmadiyya in the Vilayet Diyarbakir have turned into real persecution of the Christians. And I will skip uh, some reports on, on Mardin and come to, to one. In one, Lepsius reports that irregular militias did loot and slain uh, Armenian and partly uh, Assyrian Christians in large numbers in the, in the Armenian villages of Abba, Kasachan, and other uh, in, in the Abaga plain. It is estimated that 2,660 Armenians and 300 Assyrians uh, were killed. The result of the systematic lo looting and massacres in the Christian villages was a mass exodus to the border. In spring 1915, uh, Khalil Bey, an uncle of Enver Pasha, uh, uh, penetrated into the region of Urmia and Dilmani, in northern Persia, 10,000 Kurds from the upper Zab region had joined he, uh, the regulars, the 20,000 regulars, and Jevdet Bey, the brother-in-law of the Turkish minister uh, uh, Enver Pasha, and the Wali of Wan, took part in this operation. The troops devastated Persian territory and all the Christian villages, the Assyrian population of Urmia region and the population of Salmas around Dilman was as far as they could not take refuge on the Russian territory uh, or, or found uh, uh, protection in the American mission, mercilessly ma were massacred by the Kurds. So one citation from uh, uh, Lepsius cites from Jodet Bey is that with a statement that he has made in a meeting on Turkish notables, we have made a clean sweep with the Armenians and Assyrians of Azerbaijan in North Persia, and we must do the same here in Van. And there are more reports, of course, on, on Urmia, which uh, I will skip here for, for time reasons. Lepsius uh, elaborates on the pan-Islamic program, and this is the final uh, uh, chapter, Itihad and Taraki, as the only plausible political motivation or program uh, for the implementation of the deportation. He tried to find clues and sufficient foundation for in the propagated policies of the Committee of the Young Turks. In 1999, the Young Turks, as we know, has deposed Sultan Hab Abdul Hamid and enforced a rigorous party rule. A shadow government was established, which uh, took almost the whole apparatus into their hand. The nationalist and centralist tendency tar targeted, of course, no not only non-Muslims, but also uh, non-Turkish minorities in general. And pan-Turkism was erected as an idol and so on. So he points to, the, to a, um, a report from the Thessaloniki con Congress in 1911. I'm not going uh, to, to go here uh, through. And the program basically says on the top, you can see sooner or later, the complete Ottomanization of all Turkish subjects would have to be carried out. But it's clear that this could never be achieved by persuasion only, but one must take refuge to armed voice. And similarly, there are other important comments. It, it is clear that this action against the Armenians and other Christians in every respect are based on the principle of this program. Concluding remarks. Yeah? Yes. It's obvious that the scene of World War really appeared as a, uh, for the young Turks as a welcome opportunity to carry out uh, the program points they had fixed four years before at the Congress in Saloniki. The ethnic and religious homogenization of Anatolia. Turkish nationalist fanatism did not shy away from the hardest measures to achieve this goal. Many Christians of all ages and sexes were left alive only when they converted to Islam. Germany was best informed with respect to the horrific incidents taking place on a large scale in the Ottoman Empire. However, the German public was kept in dark. Instead, the press was supplied with Turkish war propaganda which denied the atrocities. In a telegram, the German consul of Aleppo, again Walter Rösler, sent to the embassy on July 27, he raises concerns about this issue. And uh, saying that I request respectfully inform the foreign office so that official Turkish denials do not appear in the German press, which would arouse the appearance of German approval. 
And this continues, of course, this way. Both Lepsius and the report are clear evidence that the measure against the Armenians, deportations, terror, killings, did not spare a Syrian Syriac in any way. Both the German embassy and the government of the G German Reich were well in the picture since later uh, summer. And uh, Germany certainly did not know everything or following the Syrian Syriac case in the same detail and extent uh, like the Armenian case. However, and as we have seen, Lepsius Bericht and German forest, uh, Foreign Office document revealed that um, uh, uh, representative enough uh, that uh, support the claim that the Armenians and the Assyrian Syriacs were suffered the same fate and German had a rough picture of what was going on during Seifu in the shadow of the Af Armenian Volkermord. That resulted in the destruction of the native, of the native population in Turkey too. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for extending the time. Thank you so much. I ask the speakers of this session to come forward so that we can have our common. Please stay. I, I will. I, I will keep standing. So. Now, first, collect the questions, so and then we can uh, answer them. Thank you very much for for all the interventions, which have been really very instructive. My question is to to the last intervention of uh, Mara Abraham. Uh, I'm not only sure that the German the German government was only informed that they even gave, according to Jacques Pateré, for example, the ideas how to go ahead with the policy. You know, this, I don't know whether it has been investigated or not. The question is, uh, in, in one of the Jacques Pateré's report, it's written that the German government was not only informed, they but were involved. They, they were involved. Exactly, yeah. Uh, that the decisions were already taken here in Berlin, in certain way. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Professor uh, Jastro. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your insightful um, uh, introduction. Um, there is this uh, saying, translation is falsification. So, uh, which is sometimes used to stress uh, how difficult it is to translate dialect that applies to all language because of the subtleties and nuances. Uh, I was just wondering whether you came across a document that contained such nuances and shed a completely different light on, on for example, an episode in, in, in the cipher. Have you came across one of those uh, um, um, documents that did that? Uh, <coughs> is my question to you? Yes. Yeah. You can take it first, it's easier. But uh, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment to Mr. To, to, uh, Mr. Jastro. That nothing is uh, an accident. I don't believe that you, you finding this man and translating this was an accident. When I think of my own progress to write this book, the progression of events that made me write my book, I realize that, it's, that see, everything seems to have been placed in my path for this to happen. Thanks. Um, my question is for Hannah. Um, I was just wondering, what exactly were these uh, people advocating for, for the Christian Assyrians? Was it just for protection? Um, or was it for other things? And also, um, for the part of this first question, because I've got to part of this first question, uh, when did they stop advocating for the Assyrians and why? And my second question is, um, why do you think it is appropriate or constructive to make a statement such as uh, claims to Assyrian ancestry are problematic? Thank you. So, who wants to, wants to start? Do you want to start? I can start. Yeah. Uh, to, the, to the question, uh, to what extent Germans were not just informed but uh, involved, of course there are uh, many, many hints and uh, that, uh, I skipped actually the section on uh, Bidya Tanhaza, uh, the, particularly there the 4th Army, was, uh, General von, von Gols, he was on his way to Mosul and um, they heard uh, of her assistance uh, somewhere in a village and um, that, that, that this was an Armenian village. I mean, they, they were claiming these Armenians in order to, the courts claiming that they were Armenians in order to bring in the, the military, because otherwise they would have to do it on their own. So then the Goldman uh, from Golst, uh, he sent uh, a detachment uh, basically against Hazakh, 
so that was one. The other case, what, what you probably mean is also that in, in the military and, and the book of uh, Goshrik, I think, uh, reveals this very much, that in every army and in the upper position, and Enver and Talat had advisors on their side, German advisors, military as a civil as well. And that even the deportation le uh, uh, degree, degree uh, could be a formulation by Germans. Uh, because there is an example mentioned in one of the reports that one German officer said, actually, we did this uh, anyhow in Belgium. When they entered, the German army entered uh, Belgium, so they had to remove everything behind the lines in order to keep the back of the so soldiers clear in order not to get attacks from the population. So this was an example even given. So th there, is, there are many hints, and the deportation, I think in the book is also mentioned that deportation uh, of the workers in the, in the, in the Baghdad Bahn was even signed by a German officer. So there are many involvements of officials, and this, this is slowly, I think, now coming up into the surface. Uh, up to now, it was just on political level, more the foreign documents, but now the military aspect, and Lepsius does not talk too much about the military aspect. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you, were asking, you were asking about uh, documents and whether they cast any uh, additional light on some aspects of the safety. But first of all, I have to make quite clear, I never worked with any documents if you understand document as a written text. I never touched a written text in this part of my work. I only interviewed people and I, I have a, a very large collection of material, but everything is uh, spoken text on tape. Uh, and this tape recorders at that time. Uh, there were no principally new aspects in my findings. What I, what I found were dialects, as I mentioned, which would have disappeared unnoticed and unknown of otherwise, and which from a linguistic point of view, from a dialectological point of view, proved to be missing links in, in you know, some uh, comprehensive picture of the dialect landscape, of the development of, of the Aramaic <coughs> language uh, in uh, various parts of uh, southeastern Turkey, and the same is true for Arabic. And this is a particular, but I mean, so Christians, anyhow, all of them, but uh, this is especially important for the Arabic speaking, Arabic speaking Christians or Arab Christians because they were also wiped out completely and uh, we have only the vaguest idea about the original uh, landscape when, when these people were, were, were still alive. And so each uh, individual finding uh, proved to be uh, very important for linguistics. I am a linguist and I was arguing from a linguistic point of view, but as I said, it's important also for moral reasons to have uh, rescued at least the name of these people and the existence of these small uh, Christian populations to have rescued them from oblivion. <coughs> Thank you. Anna? So, uh, advocacy work for, so I spoke just for the League of Nations Union because uh, that is a very, very new, new point to know what uh, the League of Nations Union or what kind of connection they had to Iraq. Um, they, uh, since they were that much concerned with minority rights, so their purpose was to secure minority rights. Because um, Cecil and Murray and so on, they were not really uh, um, um, acquainted with uh, March Moon or something else, but uh, when you look at the advocacy of the Archbishop of Canterbury, you have a quite different advocacy, because all of them made advocacy to the British government to secure somehow protection for the Syrian Christians in Iraq during all these uh, um, attempts to settle them uh, in northern Iraq, so uh, uh, before uh, this uh, similar massacre happened, so there were a lot of uh, uh, attempts to settle them. Um, so there were, in, in, in a way, um, foreign protection to have um, this small, tiny minority to be secured because they were allies of the um, uh, British military during World War One, and therefore it was a, a sort of moral obligation to have to secure protection for them. 
So they stopped, the League of Nations stopped uh, with their uh, advocacy uh, because of World War II. Um, so we have a lot of uh, other, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury is continuing, so they are trying uh, to uh, secure some uh, ecclesiastical personnel, in, uh, so they, they make a lot of interventions in Iraq once more and, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, then of course after uh, World War II uh, the advocacy is continuing in, uh, with the uh, United Nations. So then the Episcopal Church, Emhart, is then again on stage. So the second, uh, the third one, uh, why it is problematic, the ancestry, the Assyrian ancestry of the Assyrian Christians. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, so uh, you must know my uh, husband is Father Sommerfeld, so I'm coming from Assyrian studies. And you know, it's, it's very uh, uh, problematic to uh, trace this kind of uh, ancestry as ethnic ancestry to the Assyrians. So, uh, that, uh, that's my standpoint. That's your so, point of view. <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, in, uh, this, uh, as, 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 as I told you from a uh, um, research but standpoint, so it is not, uh, not to be heard. Mention your name, please, yeah. also. I'm so, my name is Erfurt, and my question is to the Honorable Kodelasso. Uh, in your book, Mlachso, so in the stories at the end of the book, you were talking with an uh, eyewitness that. Uh, he is Ibrahim, and then he was talking about his life story, his autobiography, and how they fled, and he was talking about the massacre in 1915, the genocide. So my question to you, and maybe to the other scholars here, do we think this can be like an enough piece of evidence, or this goes to the narrative genre? Thank you, because he said everything in details, how they kidnap and, and how they kill the people in the fields, how they did the massacre in the other Blaxo villages, so is this enough evidence for me that this is very enough? Thank you. My name is Sabri Atman. Uh, it's not a question, but uh, just a short comment about journal responsibility. Uh, we have two sources uh, published in Turkish, uh, Talat Pasha and, uh, and uh, Ralph Orbay's memoirs. They are published in Turkish, and both they are saying that the deportation order they uh, get from Germany. This is what Bertrand uh, also claims that probably it has been written on the desk of, of a German advisor, yeah, and then just signed by that person. Uh, I have no doubt uh, to. I, I have no reason to doubt the authenticity uh, and truthfulness of that particular report because it's. Uh, corroborated by, by many other reports from, from other ethnic groups uh, and it fits, in, it fits into the general uh, picture. But what is the most convincing um, part of it is the linguistic evidence because you cannot invent the language. And, and this language existed without any doubt and we were able to salvage uh, enough of it to, to be able to describe its main characteristics. <coughs> if there are no more urgent questions, I want to uh, finish off this session. I, I, I much enjoyed it and I'm just, well, if, if you allow me a, a few very small comments in the sense that what, what I picked up from uh, Professor Yastro's uh, lecture is also the fact, I started thinking about that we really have to employ these sources more than we have so far. Um, and, and it's not just about the details whether a massacre took place here and there at that time. That too, that is important and these oral witnesses confirm many of what we know from other sources. But also to get more of a feeling of how people experience what, what happened to them and what, how are they transmitting their stories to the next generation. I think it's really important that we go back and back to these sources. We often read them once and know the facts, so to say. I think we have to go back to them and try to understand more of, of what these people are trying to tell us with their stories of what happened to them. Um, from from Hannah's lecture, I, I kind of took with me that we the next step, if, um, tomorrow, my paper included, but there's others who will talk about the Assyrians in Iraq and that story. We have a lot of different sources and we don't integrate them enough. We have all these separate stores, stories based on separate uh, uh, um, sources and I think it's time for us to go and start making 
connections between these different sources, but that's difficult because they have different perspectives and different aims, etc. And I see that as a task for for the time ahead. And um, the last paper, I, I I still struggle with that. And um, so, how to deal with the German complicity in this? And then, in a sense, it's not just the Germans. When we talk about the Assyrians, they are blaming the British for a lot of what happened to them. So it would be a bit uh, stupid to just look at the Germans in this respect, but there is a, a Western complicity in what has happened in the Ottoman Empire in that period. And I think we only kind of started with understanding these back and forth connections. And I hope maybe tomorrow we can go a bit further in that, but the rest of that will be our homework, I think, for after the conference. It's too complicated to do today. Yes, of course. A very short remark, yes, uh, a very short <coughs> remark concerning the sources. Uh, there is a big difference between written sources and, and the spoken utterances because every piece of writing is a voluntary act and it implies uh, a certain uh, attention. Uh, you have to compose it in your head. You have to consider the style. Sometimes you are struggling with the written language and uh, Compared to that, the oral uh, records are of a much greater immediacy. Mm. They, they, they come out very spontaneously, and they are not always, <coughs> very frequently, they are not in, in, in very good style. They are broken sentences, they are, they are grammatical mistakes because of the uh, emotion of the speaker, but they are much more immediate. Uh, and, and, and they are a very important uh, uh, piece of evidence to, uh, to uh, add, to be added to the, to the sources. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.